So, there is these two men in Manhattan, 1957. One of them has much more power and influence than the other, and the other one's just trying to hang on to what he's got and then get ahead. The beta man's always running behind the icy-hearted alpha male. No empathy in that man. Maybe he doesn't love anybody, or the one person he loves is a blood relation. In this case, his sister. And the beta man's flattering him, trying to please him, because without toxic alpha man's approval, he might lose his clients and be out of a job. He even agrees to do something unethical, well outside the purview of his normal work. But he doesn't have much choice. If he doesn't, he can't make his clients happy, and he'll be out of a job. So he humbles himself. He grovels. At the end, he comes to a bad end. And the powerful man, he comes face to face with the limits of his own power. If that sounds a little bit familiar somehow, like it might be relevant to our times, it shouldn't because the sweet smell of success directed by alexander mckendrick and shot by james wong howe and largely written by the great american playwright of the 30s and 40s clifford odets it's about just two men scrambling for power whereas any situation i can think of relevant to our times involves many men scrambling for power, doing favors for the alpha male sycophants, beta males, and some beta females. This movie is set in a small self-contained world of man Hatton, involving Burt Lancaster, who plays J.J. Hunsecker, the writer of a syndicated gossip column, 60 million readers, he can make or break careers. And Tony Curtis plays Sidney Falco, the toadying little sycophant press agent who's always trying to get his clients into Hunsecker's column so that he will not be out of a job. And on the side, he's trying to scratch and fight and scramble his way up closer to the top of the heap. Hunsick is the golden ladder to the places I want to get. Where do you want to get? Way up high, Sam, where it's always balmy. Where no one snaps his fingers and says, hey, shrimp, break the balls. Or, hey, mouse, mouse, go out and buy me a pack of butts. I don't want tips from the kitty. I'm in the big game with the big players. My experience, I can give you in a nutshell. Dog eat dog. In brief, from now on, the best of everything is good enough for me. That doesn't have anything to do with our times, right? Oh, the only powerful sycophant men curring for favor I can think of are at the absolute top of the power scale at the national level, the federal level, and to be sure, those men in trying to curry favor have done some things. Maybe they have compromised whatever scruples they ever had, but at least they haven't pressured a poor cigarette girl into doing a favor for a rich man so that the rich man would in turn do a favor for them. At least not so far as I knew. Sydney, I don't do this sort of thing. What sort of thing? This sort of thing. You need him for a favor, don't you? Well, so do I. I need his column tonight. Didn't you ask me to do something about your job? Don't you have a kid in military school?
It's another reason that this movie doesn't really bear much resemblance to anything going on today. J.J. Hunsaker, as bad as he is, and he is an SOB to the nth degree. Hey, that rhymed. Mr. Falco, whom I did not invite to sit at this table tonight, is a hungry press agent and fully up to all the tricks of his very slimy trade. Match me, Sydney. But at least he is a real alpha male. It's not as if he had a dad who made him a millionaire by the time he was nine years old through contributions to his trust fund, made him a multi-millionaire by the time he was 20, never had to lift a finger. It's not as if he had somebody like his dad and Roy Cohen showing him how to game the system. And so the many of the blue collar workers laboring for him got stiffed. At least JJ is good at his job. And so it's just a coincidence that today, when we're shooting November 27th, 2020, a few days ago, a certain Emily finally gave the go-ahead for the transfer of power. A man who won the popular vote by a good margin, the man who won the electoral vote by a good margin can now proceed with the transition. Although the guy now in the White House, he doesn't want to leave. So I guess he will just stay there in one of the spare rooms as kind of a squatter. All right, now the whole world doesn't necessarily agree with me about this. In fact, I got into a big fight about it, a uh, street fight with a bunch of guys, a bunch of men on um, a Facebook film noir fan page. Mm. Mm. I'm not faking it. I'm not fake. I'm not fake news, not a fake woman. This is a uh, real gin, gin gimlet. I've got uh, some flask, oh, the flask. Should talk about this flask. Um, this is, my father took this away from a, a man in a speakeasy in 1930s. And uh, I just saw one like it on eBay for 40, $5.99 in case I ever need a little extra money on the side. It's called a hip flask, but I can't put it back in my back pocket right now. It needs a lime. I've got a lime, but uh, I don't have a knife. Plus, it's hard to garnish a hip flask with a slice of lime. Anyway, so I was in a big street fight on Facebook, and I told these men, if it weren't for James Wong Howe shooting this like film noir, we might not see it as film noir at all because after all, there are no guns, no bodies, no bank heists, no one gets killed. I think the only really prosecutable crimes in the movie is a, um, a failed, a weak and failed attempt at blackmail and a false charge that is called into the police. Other than that, it's about a level of corruption that's hard to nail down, hard to prosecute.
I think that this movie, without the imagery, without the deep saturated shadow and shiny light, might be seen as cousin to the low budget black and white films being made in England around that time. The so-called angry young man movies advocating for social change. Especially since this was written largely by Clifford Odets, based on a novel by Ernest Lehman. Clifford Odets, socialist, leaned that way, leaned way that way. Clifford Odets believed change was necessary. And unlike Polanski and Chinatown that spoke to the corruption, the innate corruption of the system, Clifford Odets believed that change was necessary and furthermore, it was possible. Change is necessary, but also possible. That is not noir, except that the photography, the vision of James Wong, how I love this dirty town, made it noir. So in this street fight on Facebook, I didn't get the most votes popular or electoral, but I declared myself the winner of that argument anyway. Hey, you know, I admit it. It's like uh, Osgood says at the end of that other Tony Curtis movie. Well, nobody's perfect. There are three featured women in this movie. There is Susan Harrison playing Susie, JJ's frightened, intimidated sister who he wants to control absolutely and is trying to break up her engagement with the man she really loves, jazz player. There is Barbara Nichols playing Rita, the cigarette girl cruelly pressed into service by Sidney Falco for his own ends. And there is the unfortunate secretary of Falco. Each one of these women is either utterly controlled by a man or manipulated by a man for his own ends, or utterly browbeaten. And that's good. That demonstrates that the writers, specifically Clifford Odets, was aware of the position of women in society, and quite frankly, the world in the mid 50s and he was addressing that in the mid 50s and you could make a case that some of that continues today. Now, I have a poem that speaks to not Manhattan in the 50s and the smarmy goings on between a seedy press agent and his power-mongering gossip columnist. I looked through all my published books, through my unpublished manuscript, and I couldn't find a single poem that was about that. But I do have a poem that speaks to my fantasy of what might happen to a man with a level of power far beyond anything he worked for or earned or deserves. Now, I, uh, I travel around with more than just my, uh, where is it, my flask, not my flask, 
my lime, got my lime. I also travel with poetry. So got my purse right here close to me because, hey, I'm in the middle of a dark alley in the middle of the night. I want to hang on to my purse. Bear with me a moment. Ah, here we go. Nobody has ever held a gun to my head and robbed me of my poetry journals. Um, this poem I'm going to read was written on uh, a COLA fellowship. COLA stands for City of Los Angeles. It is an endowment to enable interesting mid-career artists and influential writers and other types of artists to create a major work. And I don't know if I created a major work, but I created a long work, a long unusual work, um, called Tweets from Hell. But in the process, I wrote a little, several studies, little studies leading up to this major work. And this one is called, um, it's called Trump in Hell. It is in this new journal, first issue of this new journal called Salt, edited and published by Christopher Buckley, himself a beautiful poet, a great champion of the poets of Fresno, and a great champion of the poetry and the writings of Philip Levine. So, ah, here, here we go, as they say. Fasten your seatbelts, if you have seatbelts. There's only one TV in old Philco, the size of furniture, circa 1956. That's why it's hell. Blueberries, Roll over the fields, the terraced hills, and plumeria, the kind they call ice lavender, the kind called cotton candy. And cypress lean along the horizon as if scripted by the wind. Beyond the mists, he glimpses majestic shapes resembling purple mountains, though he can't recall where he heard that phrase, purple. Majesties, where's all the real estate? Where is his golden name? Horror lands on him like the weight of all his lies, each one a half an ounce. Do that math. And he's hungry. Vines burst with offerings, and trees drop every dreamed of deep and ripened fruit, and in such colors. And this time, not one is forbidden. Where are his hamburgers and fries, his steak, his red meats? I'm in hell, he cries, and for once, he's not lying. He tries to settle his girth in the narrow plastic armchair perched near the TV. On the small screen, housewives in high net collars praise the heaven of sunbeam electric fry pans and Nestle Quick. The programming stuck forever in the age when America was great. And now the stations start shutting down for the night. And now the small screen fills with snow. It fills with flames. Mm -hmm. From salt. That's very Fresnoian. Mm, hardly anybody ever accused the poems that come out of Fresno. Or, in fact, 
most of the poems coming out of L.A. as just not having enough salt. That's all I got. I'm used up. Beyond this, I got nothing. So you know the routine. Good night, ladies. Good night, gentlemen. And remember, look both ways. Watch your back and don't let anybody treat you like you're two for a dime. Thank you.